Our gospel for this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark, the 12th chapter, found on page 825 of the Pew Bibles. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers they will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, over the past few months, I've talked about a number of different documentaries that I've seen on Netflix. So you already know I'm a Netflix junkie. And you already know I'm a documentary junkie. A couple months ago, I saw a documentary on Netflix (laughs) called The Drop Box. It popped up in the new releases. I'm like, oh, well, this looks interesting. The Drop Box. It's a story about abandoned babies in Seoul, South Korea. And believe it or not, it's a story of hope and faith. Because a number of years ago, a local pastor in Seoul and his wife saw so many babies abandoned on the streets, dying, that they decided to do something about it. They made a baby box, a box built into the wall of their church, insulated with a warming light and a bell, so that a distressed mother could drop off her baby, no questions asked. The baby would be placed in the box, often with a note, and the mother would ring the bell. Day or night, Pastor Lee would hear the bell, he'd run down the stairs and bring the baby in to be cared for. And lots of these babies have serious medical issues. That's the reason that their mothers feel they can't take care of them. And these moms feel terrible about abandoning their children. The notes they write are just heart-wrenching. But in that country and in that culture and in that situation, they don't see any other option. So without the drop box, those babies would die on the street. With the drop box, There's a way for these babies to live. In the movie, Pastor Lee says that one of the mothers told him that she had enough poison to kill both herself and her baby. So he told her, don't do that. Come here with your baby. The drop box is about saving lives. Pastor Lee feels called by God to save the lives of these babies. He and his wife have actually adopted about 15 of these children themselves. (laughs) So through the Lees and the people who work with them, God is providing love and care and shelter for orphans in South Korea. Now all through the Bible... God tells us it's important to care for the orphan and the widow, right? You've probably heard that over the years, this theme throughout the Bible. The movie The Dropbox tells about caring for the orphan. Our scriptures today talk about the widow. In fact, we've got two widows, one in each scripture. In Mark's gospel, we've got the story of the widow's might, the widow who lives in poverty and gives everything that she has to live on to the temple treasury. Now, to be fair... This story is told for at least one of two reasons, and it's probably told for both reasons. First, this is a critique of the temple system, because the scribes collect too much from these widows. These first century women have no source of income, no way to make a living, yet the scribes have no qualms about these poor widows giving all that they have to the temple. So it's a critique. But on the other hand, there's the second reason. (laughs) The story is told to show the contrast between the scribes and the widow. The scribes are proud and they oppress the poor, but the faithful widow 
gives sacrificially. She gives out of her poverty, trusting that God will provide. And because scripture tells these Jewish leaders to care for the orphan and the widow, it's possible, it's possible that some of the widow's needs will be met through the temple where she gave her offering. But however those needs are met, it's clear that the widow trusts that her needs will be met. She's not crying over those coins as she's dropping them in. She gives them freely, trusting that somehow God will provide what she needs to live. So that's our first widow. The other widow is from years earlier in the Old Testament. We don't know her name, so we call her the widow at Zarephath, the town that she lived in. So she lives in this town in Sidon, so she doesn't live in Israel. She's a foreigner, and she doesn't necessarily believe in Elijah's God, the God of Israel. In fact, when she talks to Elijah, she calls God the Lord your God. Not our God, but the Lord your God. But for some reason, for some reason, when the prophet Elijah shows up, this widow has enough faith in Elijah's God, our God, to do what he says. She feeds Elijah first before feeding herself and her son what she believes will be their last meal before starvation takes them in a time of drought. She does what Elijah said, and miraculously, there is food enough for all of them until the drought ends and the rains fall. The meal never runs out, and neither does the oil. God provides basic food, cakes of meal for them to live on. God provides. Well, that's well and good for Bible times. But how often does something like that happen today? I mean, whose bag of flour never goes empty? other than Glendie's. We've already established it's because she's not baking enough. (laughs) But whose jug of milk never runs dry? We don't hear stories like that. So how does God provide the basics today? How does God provide food and shelter and clothing? Through miracles, like the one he used to feed the widow at Zarephath? Through organizations, like the temple the other widow gave her coins to? through the kindness of strangers, through people like us? There are lots of ways to answer those questions. But the answer I find most meaningful, to me anyway, is one I found in this book. This is a wonderful book that somebody donated to the church. It's called In God's Hands, and it's a story of two Jewish men, one rich and one poor, who both come to understand that their hands are the hands of God. And I love that because if our hands are the hands of God, then God provides through us. Now I happen to be one of those people who believes that God always provides enough. You know, there's enough food in the world to feed everybody. The amount of food isn't the problem. The problem is that people get in the way of getting that food where it needs to go. So God always provides, and sometimes God provides through us. Do you want to know how? Yes, I know you do, okay? Good, because I'm going to tell you, even if you don't want to know. We had a concert here a couple weeks ago and raised over $350 for the NACE food shelf, and that was on top of food donations that people brought in. We had Trunk and Treat a couple weeks ago. Food donations from that went to the food shelf. Jesus Delivers has a new name. They're Jesus Refills. And lots of you last month dropped off coats for them to give to people in need in St. Paul so they can be warm this winter. Okay? They've got a silent auction going on today, and anything you give helps provide a hot meal for hungry people in St. Paul. The funds raised from that auction are going to provide Thanksgiving meal and Christmas meal. There's a group of regulars who serve those meals. If you want to do that, talk to Karen Bermel or anybody else out there working the auction. They will make that happen. They're helping on Tuesdays and Thursdays this winter. So, you know, if you want to do that, by all means, go for it. A group of you are going to Guatemala next month to build a house. Those of us who aren't on the trip, we can contribute to that. So together, we will provide a home for a family. 
And I can't remember if it was last year or the year before, but there was enough money to be able to buy a water filtration system for a couple families in Guatemala too. Okay? So shelter and clean water. God provides through us. Okay? Operation Christmas Child is up and running. When you pack a shoebox for a child, you provide a gift. You put a smile on their face, you tell them about Jesus, and you show them the love of Jesus by packing that shoebox. Right here at Our Saviors, we made a decision as a congregation last January that we were going to provide faith education for kids who come in these doors. Sherry talked about that a little bit. And the budget's tight this year, but it's because together we decided that Sunday school and Jesus and me and confirmation would be provided by all of us together. We're not putting more of that on young parents with registration fees. We got rid of the registration fees and we are sharing the cost. Because sharing the joy and love of Jesus with each and every child who enters this building is what we do. We are the people of God and God provides Christian education for those kids through us, which is pretty awesome. So one last thing I have to tell you about. People give to the pastor's discretionary fund that we have here at church. And there are two huge things that God provides through that fund. Number one, food and gas for people in crisis. When that fund is in good shape, we're able to give gas cards and food cards when there's a family dealing with a crisis. Okay? And number two, counseling. Insurance is getting better about covering mental health, but there are still situations where counseling isn't covered. And when that happens, we are able to help. We send people to Hope Counseling in Wyoming, and we help pay for it if it's not covered. Mental health care is a basic necessity, and it is fantastic that God provides that through us. It's pretty awesome. The bottom line of all of this is that God provides and that our hands are the hands of God. So whether it's saving orphans in South Korea or providing food, gas, and counseling here in Minnesota, God provides through us. So I'm going to pull a Glendy and I'm giving you homework this week. Okay? My dad was a teacher. He'll be so proud to hear I gave you homework. All right. Your homework this week is to think about all the ways that God provides through you. I'm confident you are already doing this, so I just want you to be aware of it. Okay? Be aware. And so as you go through your week, every time that you realize that God is providing for someone through you, tell yourself that you have been part of a miracle. Because your hands are the hands of God. And when God provides through you, it is no less a miracle than when God fed the widow at Zarephath. Amen. Yeah.
as he stands in victory. Sin's curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine. But with the precious blood of Christ, guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my death. Oh